And thank you all for joining me today. My name is Benjamin Gartoff. This summer I worked in the Updike lab, and today I'd like to tell you a little bit about my project using the auxin inducible degradation system, or the AID system. First, you need to know about germ granules. Germ granules are a specific type of organelle found in germ cells, the, the cells that form gametes. And what's interesting about these germ granules is they're found in all sexually reproducing organisms. And you can see them around the nuclei of germ cells in C. elegans right over here. These are known to be incredibly important for maintaining uh, germ cell pluripotency, but unfortunately they're difficult to study in most organisms. So that leads me to why we study them in C. elegans. And in C. elegans, their germ granules are called P. granules. And C. elegans, this one millimeter long round worm, these germ granules are very easy to study. And other benefits of working with this as a model organism is that they're entirely transparent and you can see all of their internal structures under the microscope. More about P. granules. The image on the left has a little bit more than you need to know, but what I want you to focus on is that as the C. elegans develop from larval stages to adulthood, when their germline proliferates and grows, the P. granules remain present around the nuclei of all of the germ cells. And these P. granules are composed of both RNA and protein, many different types. And what we've found in the past is that without these P. granules, worms can be sterile and their germlines start to differentiate. Bad things happen. More about the components of P. granules. As I mentioned, they're composed of RNA and protein, but we're going to focus on two main families of proteins. The P. granule abnormality proteins, of which there is PIGL1, 2, and 3, and the germline helicases, GLH1, 2, 3, and 4. And there are many others, but we're not going to talk about those today. What you can see on the right is a GLH1 uh, strain of worms that's been labeled with a fluorescent protein so that you can visualize these P. granules. And it's known that most of the components of P. granules are involved in RNA metabolism and RNA binding, so that gives the germline uh, a way to regulate post-transcriptionally. <coughs> and again, we know these P. granules are incredibly important. And how we know this is because without them, the germline has problems. And there are two different ways, two main different ways, that you can see this result or that you can disassemble P. granules. One is using RNAi to target on the mRNA, the mRNA level. When you run a control RNAi and stain for the, di uh, stain for the germline, P. granules, you see them present as would be expected. However, when you run an RNAi, you interfere with the mRNA components, you lose P. granules in the germline and the worms can become sterile. However, that method is a little limited, which brings us to using uh, a technique to degrade P. granule proteins directly. And that's my project, using this aid system to degrade proteins specifically and conditionally. This technique has been shown to be used in C. elegans already, but this is the first technique where we're targeting P. granule components. And it consists of two main, two main aspects. You have degrons, which are short amino acid sequence tags that we engineer onto our target proteins using CRISPR. And then you have auxin, which is actually a plant hormone, which serves as an inducer molecule. And in the presence of this hormone auxin, the system is turned on and your target proteins are degraded. What this meant for me this summer was that I had to isolate a strain with a very specific genotype. So first, Liz Marnick, the postdoc I worked with in the Updike lab, engineered these Degron tags onto the end of our target genes, the Piggle proteins. And so that was one component that we needed to isolate. The other was the GLH1 GFP phenotype so that we could visualize our P granules. And we had to verify that we had this strain of worms. So after a crossing, we, we checked under a fluorescent microscope just to see if our worms had the fluorescence. Because if they didn't have the fluorescence, there was no point in going further in genotyping. Following that, we used PCR, which is just a technique used to amplify DNA. 
And we amplified the PIGL1 gene and the PIGL3 gene to see if we had the insert. This top row up here shows you that all of the samples tested were homozygous. Uh, both copies of the genome had the insert. And that's indicative, uh, that's, you can see that because of the higher band. And it's a little bit easier to explain on the bottom where you see there's differences. So these first four samples were homozygous for our Degron insert. The bottom band was homozygous, but it didn't have the insert. And where you see two bands, that's where you have one copy of the genome with your insert, one without. Essentially, what we had to do was just isolate this strain and allow it to reproduce. And that's what we did. After we isolated our aid strain, we applied them, uh, we, we exposed them to our inducer molecule, auxin. And we did this at varying concentrations and for varying amounts of time. And then we were able to actually dissect out the germline and stain for presence or absence of our target protein. And this is very preliminary at this point, but what we found was that a four millimolar concentration of auxin for four hours is sufficient to see the results I'm about to show you. On the left, you see a control image. This is a dissected germline that's been stained for one of our target proteins, PIGL1. And as expected, you see the aggregations around the nuclei. PIGL1 is still present. However, on the right, when we expose our worms to auxin and stain for PIGL1, we see that it is now gone from around the nuclei of the germ cells. And Liz Marnick, again, she confirmed this using a Western blot, which is a technique used to check for presence or absence of a protein. And on the bottom is an internal control tubulin that's expected to be positive for both samples. And on the right, we have our control where PIGL1 is still present and auxin treated PIGL1 is again gone. This just recapitulates the images above. So what do we take home from this? One, the aid system itself works. And this is, this is pretty groundbreaking because it's the first time we've actually shown this to work targeting P granule components. In addition, this happens really quickly. Four hours is incredibly quick for this reaction, this, this process to occur. And so that, that in and of itself is important. And you might be wondering, why would we choose to study these P granules in the germ cells of C. elegans? It seems a little bit arbitrary at first. But there are actually a couple of reasons for this. First off, cancer cells, interestingly, have been shown to express germ granule components very similar to P granules. And we know that by interfering with interactions, we can better understand what's going on in these germ cells. So it's the hope that over time, the knowledge we gain from this study will be able to be applied to other fields, such as cancer research, where these germ granules are expressed. Additionally, we want to better understand germline pluripotency, the ability of your germ cells to be able to keep dividing and dividing to give rise to the next generation for thousands of years. This has been going on, and that's pretty incredible. Moving forward, we need to confirm that PIGL3 is being degraded, because I showed you the image where PIGL1 is degraded. We want to confirm this with PIGL3. We also want to cross in the PIGL2 degron line to see if there's any difference when we're targeting the entire family of PIGL proteins. We also want to determine the effects of P granule depletion long term, which is really the, the end goal of this project. We want to better understand the interactions occurring in these P granules. And so we can use techniques such as RNA-seq. Uh, we sequence the transcripts that change and what, what types of genes are turned on or turned off after P granules are gone. I need to thank Everybody in the Updike lab, especially my mentor, Dustin Updike, and the postdoc, Liz Marnick. Without them, I would be nowhere. I'd also like to thank all of the research assistants, especially Heath Fuquay. He's amazing. And I'd also like to thank a few other people, such as Jared Rollins in the Rogers lab for letting me just bounce ideas off of him whenever I needed to, as well as some of my fellow undergrads and the entire MDIBL community for opening their arms to me being here. 
Uh, I'd also like to thank the University of Maine at Augusta biology faculty, because again, I would not be here without them, and they've pushed me forward to pursue this. I was funded by a National Science Foundation REU grant, and I would be happy to take any questions. So, so the question is, why did we choose to use the oxen-inducible degradation system? And the answer to that is that up until now, techniques for conditional protein depletion have actually been pretty limited. But this technique has been shown to work in C. elegans. And so that's why we went forward with this, to try to target germline-specific components. Anybody else? Dr. Bob? Um, when you used the AIDS system, the auxin system, mm -hmm. and you depleted PIGL1, we saw that, that PIGL1 staining disappeared. Mm -hmm. uh, did you also see PIGL2 staining disperse? Uh, does, it, does it just eliminate PIGL1, and, uh, or does it also disperse the P granules entirely? Well, the, the question is, when we see degradation of PIGL1, uh, do we see other germline components disperse into the germline or be degraded? And specifically, to, to address PIGL2, that would not be degraded because it had not been tagged with the Degron. And we also were not able to confirm that PIGL3 was being degraded, but I have images here where we stained for another germline component, GLH1. And this is what we labeled with the green fluorescent protein to visualize. And it's very interesting because you see in the control, you actually still have presence of GLH1 around the germline nuclei and in the auxin treated. In the control, it's expected, but in the auxin treated, we didn't really know what would happen. And then with the auxin treatments, again, PIGL1 is gone. But GLH1 remains in P granules, which shows that the P granules themselves are not actually breaking down entirely. Thank you very much, Benjamin.